perpetrating a fraud on our community. They've had due time to be present tonight, and they are all in default. They are all in default. And now we will be executing judgment on them. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, tonight we are blessed by the Creator and the ancestors to have the spirit of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, alive in the house tonight. Let us all rise, stand on our feet, and put our hands together for our keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. Let's give Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. Let's give it up for Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. Dr. Khaled. Dr. Khaled. Dr. Khaled. Dr. Khaled. Arambe. 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 In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. We forever thank Almighty God, Allah, for coming in the person of Master Farad Muhammad and raising up a divine leader, a divine teacher, and a divine guide in the person of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank the two of them, no matter how much water is gone under the bridge, no matter what has gone down, no matter what has transpired, I thank the two of them for the man who is largely responsible for what I am and what I am becoming. And I will never show myself ungrateful to that. And I will never deny him. I speak of none other than the man who is responsible for my spiritual and cultural rites of passage. My spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, in their names, I greet you here at the United African Movement and the warrior lawyer who makes sure that this information gets to the minds and hearts of black people here in New York and is known all over the globe from the slave all the way to where we are today, the warrior lawyer, attorney Alton Maddox and the entire United African Movement family. and the entire United African Movement family and to his queen who is dedicated, to his queen who is committed, to his queen who has decided that she is indeed, as the scripture says, his helpmeet. And she is helping him to meet his divine obligation to Almighty God, to the ancestors, and to our people, let's give her a strong black hand, Sister Leona Maddox. Stand for her, Sister Leona Maddox. Give her a strong black hand. Give her a strong black hand. All praise is due to Allah.
I see in our audience brother to hut nine and the brothers and sisters who were responsible for the great event honoring our ancestors and honoring contemporaries and paralleling them with our ancestors as they have pointed out to us a spirit that grew out of the million youth march let's give brother to hut nine a strong black hand And Brother Tahad, would you introduce everyone on the row there with you that was at the event? Stand, please, and just introduce them quickly, sir. And who we all know, give a strong hand, Mr. Fulzi. Give her a strong black hand. Give him a strong black hand. And Brother Chuma and Brother Henry are not here. Sister Kepra is on the front row with Black Track. Give her a strong black hand. And in the audience is the man who names the names, Brother Steve Coakley. Give him a strong black hand. To Brother Khaled, Hadi, the minister of the Honorable Silas Muhammad and the Lost Found Nation of Islam, which Minister Hadi is based here in Brooklyn, New York, and to the staff of Muhammad Speaks, let us give them all a strong black hand. To young brother Jamil from the new Black Panther Party in New Jersey, and to the other members, and to the other members of the new Black Panther Party who are in our audience, give them a strong black hand. We are just returning from Dallas, Texas, from the national new Black Panther Party Summit where New Black Panther leadership came together from all across the country. We held our elections, and now we're working on the new Black Panther Global Intercommunal News Service. And by the grace and the power of God, I was elected national chairman of the New Black Panther Party. <laughs> Brother Aaron, Brother Aaron Michaels, who is one of the founders of the new Black Panther Party and responsible for the resurgence of the Black Panther Party. Brother Aaron Michaels was elected the National Minister of Defense. In his absence, let's give him a strong black hand. And on yesterday, our young warrior lawyer, who looks up to our warrior lawyer, walking in his footsteps and patterning himself after him, Attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz. He fought a good fight. He ran a good race for one of the two at-large city council seats in Washington, D.C. He was defeated by two homosexual uh, white candidates. And now as attorney, well, it was in the post today. They said they were homosexual. That's what the Post said. As far as I'm concerned, they all homosexual. I need that bag, sir. Attorney Malik Shabazz got over 15,000 votes, and we are very happy and very honored. Those of us who backed him and supported him, I did not vote. I don't live in D.C., but I've never voted in my entire life. I just haven't voted in my entire life. Maybe that'll be one of the questions you'll ask me. And you're proud you've never voted? Some silly one, write that question down. One of the silly ones so you can make sure to ask me. If you don't have a pen, ask some, tap the person next to you and say, may I borrow your pen so I can ask this silly question? <laughs> Tonight, brothers and sisters, no holes barred. This was to be 
set up by the united african movement making this forum open and available this was to be a community forum where the family would come together see virginia fields manhattan borough president my neighbor across the street from me on strivers row charlie Rangel, congressman congressman charlie Rangel. <laughs> Congressman Charlie Rangel was to be here, as Attorney Maddox has said. Councilman, what's his name, Bill Perkins, was scheduled to be here. And another Negro. Oh, David Patterson, he's such a pitiful fella. He came on the news after the Million Youth March talking about what Khalid Muhammad did didn't see a damn thing. <laughs> didn't see nothing. Don't know what went on unless somebody told him what happened. Bless his heart. He's just as pitiful as he can be. But it is written in your Bible, black man and woman, when the blind leaves the blind, they both end up in the ditch. Another scripture says they are blind leaders and they have led the people astray. Charlie Rangel, C. Virginia Fields, Bill Perkins, all of them are just as blind mentally, morally, spiritually, politically, culturally as David Patterson. And we all end up in the ditch if we continue to follow such blind leadership. And so tonight we will put the mic, I believe we will have a mic, is that right, Brother Clemson? Up here, can we, how do we get them down there? Well, I'm going to do a little bit more than that. I'm going to pass. This is the mic which will be down on the floor for you. We ask that you don't make a speech. We ask that you can speak your piece strongly and ask your question as strongly as possible or as necessary. Any questions that you have. This is the night to ask. Million Youth March questions. Questions about whatever might be on your mind. The new African cultural holiday alternative to Thanksgiving, Gina May. Any questions, controversial questions, crazy questions, silly questions, the ones you think put me on the hot seat. Whatever it is that crosses your mind, ask your questions here tonight. And so we open this forum up to you and to your questions. You can form a line in the center aisle and come down and ask your questions. Mic check. Let's get the drummers a strong black hand. The drummer's a better hand than that. He. For the record, brother and sister, would you please state your name uh, loudly and clearly, and then ask your question, please. My name is Alfonso McGriff III. I traveled here from Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, my question is, um, what was your feeling about the speech in reference to the World Day of Atonement by the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, and how did you feel about Brother Malik Zulu Shabazz being verbally discipline, disciplined in front of the world? By whom? Uh, Minister Farrakhan. His question is, y'all ready for this? I said make it hot, didn't I? Brother King with his hot sauce bottle in his back pocket. <laughs> he said, what do I feel about the Day of Atonement speech by Minister Louis Farrakhan, and of course that was at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and what do I feel about Attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz, the National Youth Director 
and legal counsel of the Million Youth March, along with attorney Michael Tarif Warren, who was lead counsel for us, and attorney, uh, attorney Roger Wareham. What do I feel about attorney Shabazz being, as he came up, I believe it was to the stage or up front, and being upbraided, and uh, what were your words, brother? Before he came to the stage, I talked in reference to him being verbally disciplined. Verbally disciplined by Minister Farrakhan. Your last words were in front of everyone. Everyone have the question? That's a good question. Hopefully the answer is just as good. The world, the Day of Atonement speech by Minister Louis Farrakhan, in my judgment, was mixed. At points, he said very strong and powerful things. At other points, he appeared to be defending Bill Clinton. He would spank him on one hand and defend him on the other hand. This is my teacher, my mentor, and my father. And I feel to some degree I know him. In studying what he said, along with the Meet the Press interview and another interview after the Day of Atonement, he appeared to cast himself in the role of Jonah. Of whom? Come on, who? He cast himself in the role of Jonah. Now, who was Jonah? Jonah, according to Scripture, was one of the prophets of God who was commanded by God to go to the wicked city, Nineveh. Nineveh had misused, abused, and oppressed God's people. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Jonah was told by God to go there and in his going and speaking to the king and speaking to the people of Nineveh, God, according to the scripture, believed that Nineveh would atone that Nineveh would go to a, through a stage of atonement and contrition and repentance. Now Jonah, kind of like me, didn't want to go nowhere near Nineveh because of the way that Nineveh had done his people. And he was not pleased with God for even suggesting that Nineveh could atone for all that she had done. But according to scripture, Jonah went in sackcloth and ashes, and the king of Nineveh met him in sackcloth and ashes. And it appears that Nineveh repented of her wickedness. Nineveh atoned for her wickedness. And so Minister Farrakhan, casting himself in the role of Jonah, was giving the impression that if Bill Clinton would call the religious leaders, as he said, to Washington, D.C., and pray with them and repent, that he would stop God's divine judgment of rain, snow, hail, earthquakes, tornadoes, and twisters, and storms, at least to ease the tension for 90 days against America. Oh, I'm scared of that. He went on to give the impression, since you ask me right off my feelings about it, he went on to give the impression that if Clinton would listen to him, adhere to him as the modern day Jonah, that America could repent that America could atone for her sins. Well, 
thank God I had a good teacher. And my teacher was the one who was speaking. And my teacher didn't tell me to stop at the book of Jonah. My teacher told me to go Jonah, Micah, and the next book called Nahum. Jonah, Micah, and Nahum. When you get to the book of Nahum, when you study the scholars, the theologians, and the seminarians, they tell you that Nineveh appeared to atone. Nineveh tried to trick God. Nineveh tried to fool God. And so Nahum goes on to say, Woe to the bloody city. Woe to the city whose streets are full of chariots and horses. And in the great and illuminating book by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, message to the black man, but even greater than that, the fall of America. In his book, The Fall of America, with flames leaping up from the book from America, he quotes Nahum in The Fall of America, and he tells us that the horses and the chariots on the streets of Nineveh represent the automobiles, the cars on the streets of America. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad went on from the book of Nahum, for Nahum prophesied the destruction of Nineveh. And the scholars tell us that shortly thereafter, after their so-called repentance period and atonement, that God destroyed Nineveh in the year 612 B.C. You got to know your stuff when you tell people to stand up and ask you any kind of question. Well, they damn sure going to ask you any kind of question. In the year 612 B.C., Nineveh was indeed destroyed. Nineveh only got a little extension of time, only was able to catch their breath from their evil and their wickedness. But I'm here to say to you, and I say to my spiritual father, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Oh, my dear father, there is no repentance for America. There is no atonement for America. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said, it is too late. It is too late. He said, it is too late that America cannot be forgiven for her crimes and her sins against the chosen people of God. We have been burned at the stake. We have been burned alive. We have been dragged in the lakes, the rivers, and drowned in the lakes, the rivers, the brooks, and the streams. He has robbed us of our names, our language, our religion, our culture, our folkways, our God, our mores, robbed us of the very power of our own being. And so, in the spirit of divine personal responsibility, Holly, if you hear me, in the spirit of divine personal responsibility, the karma that is on America and the white man cannot be lifted, cannot be lifted from her. And so America, the scripture says, double unto her, double unto her what she has given. Another scripture says, as thou hast done, so shall it be done unto you. Another scripture says, my dear father, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, when I was blind, deaf, and dumb, you came after me and lifted me up from the graveyard of the white man's ignorance. And as it appears that you have deviated from the path of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad as your little son, as your little student, I don't want any harm to come to you, but it is my divine duty to come after you with the truth of Elijah Muhammad as you came after me. Oh, I'm a new Khalid Muhammad now. I'm a new Khalid Muhammad now. I've been shot down in cold blood. Nine millimeter bullets in my body. Five people shot down all around me. And my little nine-year-old at that time 
little Farrakhan Khalid Muhammad. No man names his son after another man unless he loves that man, honors that man, reveres that man, and looks up to that man as his hero. My little son Farrakhan Khalid Muhammad almost struck by a nine millimeter bullet, found three other nine millimeters in a sack, found a 30 yard six rifle with a scope, waiting to take my life. I have waded through the blood of an assassination attempt. I have sat in the hole and in the dungeons of the white man's prison. I have stood up against the most awesome crackers of the world. The White House against me, the Senate against me, the Congress against me, the governor, the mayor, the police, the army, the navy, the air force, the FBI, the CIA. God damn it, I don't fear nothing but God himself. Only God and God alone. Only God and God alone. I wish we had our brother here tonight. Who's the brother that does the poem? What's his name? Brother Heru. Oh, I wish we had Brother Heru here tonight. But I'm telling you, my dear father, the scripture that you taught me from the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said in Exodus 21 and 16, he that stealeth a man and selleth that man, and if he be caught with that man in his hands, he shall surely be put to death. The white man admits he stole us. He admits he sold us from city to city, from plantation to plantation, from auction block to auction block. And now, in the presence of Almighty God, within the borders of the hells of North America, we are still in the white man's hands. He that stealeth a man and selleth that man, and if he be caught with that man in his hands, he shall surely be put to death. Another scripture says, as you have delighted in taking our blood, you will be given your own blood to drink like water. Oh, there is no repentance for America. There is no atonement for America. Read the book of Nahum, two books after Jonah. Now, I'm, if you would have said you were Nahum, I could hum with you on that. But not Jonah. You're not going to save this beast. Supreme wisdom, the lessons given to the young lost found Elijah Muhammad by his teacher, Master Farad Muhammad. It says that this is the first term examination for Mr. Elijah Muhammad, one of the lost found. And these questions are answered very near, correct. In the supreme lesson, supreme wisdom lessons of the lost found nation of Islam, we are told that you cannot reform the devil. The question is asked, and can you reform devil? Which automatically intimates the repentance and the atonement of the devil. And the answer said that all of the, emphatically no. What did it say? No. It said emphatically no. What did it say? Emphatically no. It says emphatically no. Oh, dear father, have you forgotten the lesson? The lessons say emphatically no says all of the prophets have tried and none of them were successful. Who do you think you are that God has come to destroy this goddamn bastard and you will get in the way to try to save this bastard? Hell no. Hell no. You get in the way of God's wrath. Now, everybody all right? Everybody okay? The second part of the question that I believe our dear brother asked had to do with attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz, the national youth director, being publicly scolded, verbally disciplined, verbally disciplined publicly by Minister Farrakhan. How do I feel about that? I didn't like it. I ain't scared to say I ain't like it, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Y'all know what I'm saying? I ain't like it. I thought he should never have done that. 
and then to stand up and beat on him and embarrass him in front of everyone during the time that he's running for public office. A candidate that we know that if he's elected, he didn't run Democrat. He didn't run Republican. He ran independent Whoa. of the white man and still got almost 16,000 votes. He ran independent. We know Malik Zulu Shabazz won't sell us out. Wherever he goes, he's uncompromising with the devil. He ran on a black platform. He didn't tiptoe. He was not afraid to go in the debates with the crackers and others and stand on a black platform for black people. Huh? Right during his campaign to bring him up in front of everybody and try to embarrass him and he called me. He sounded so hurt on the phone when he called me because he too, as I, he loves Minister Farrakhan. He looks up to Minister Farrakhan and he was very hurt that Minister Farrakhan talked kind of down about the Million Youth March. Then he went on to say how he, <laughs> how he, started the Million Man March. Nobody didn't check with him. Come on, dear father. You're the one that taught me about arrogance, ego, pure motives. He went on to say with Brother Malik standing there that if your heart is not right in words or if your motives are not pure, then you won't be successful. What are you saying, Minister Farrakhan? Are you the only one with pure motives? 196,940,000 square miles of the planet Earth? Nobody else has pure motives except you? No, sir. I must respectfully disagree with you. There are many of us who have pure motives. We did not call the Million Youth March for some vain purpose. We call the Million Youth March to raise the issue, to raise the battle cry, to raise again the spirit of black power, black nationalism, pan-Africanism, and black liberation theology. Black power! Black power! Black power! Black power. Black power. Again, in the minds and hearts of our youth in particular, and our people in general to put black power back on the agenda, to plant it firmly in the minds and hearts of our youth that they would take us into the 21st century, not with the old tired, worn out, dead end solutions, but with plans for our liberation and salvation, with plans for our freedom and independence. That's why we called it you don't play with your life just to be seen. This cracker Giuliani is a vicious little puny peck of wood. Yeah. This cracker, Howard Safer, looking like a little sweet thing, makes me wonder about the whole history of J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson. Hey, I know I heard that somebody dressed up for the gay parade in full drag. I holla if you hear me. I holla if you hear me. Somebody dressed up in full drag. No man in his right mind will put on the clothes of a woman and strut before the world, switching and acting like a little faggot. Unless he is a little faggot. But whatever might be going on between certain parties, I don't have anything to do with what is happening between consenting adults behind city hall doors. <laughs> Consenting adults behind city hall doors. I don't have anything to do with that. But you don't play with these beasts. Saying we went to Jasper, Texas. It was a show. 
no goddamn show. Them tobacco chewing, snuff chewing, snuff dipping, straw chewing, overall wearing cowboy boot, cowboy hat, wearing peck of redneck peck of woods, don't play in Texas. And they certainly don't play with some niggas who have the nerve to come to their town with shotguns, rifles, and assault weapons. That ain't nothing to play with. And we had all kinds of training and maneuvers before we went. You let no damn body tell you that the guns weren't loaded. You should have read Peter Noel's piece. He was there. We unloaded, locked and loaded in front of him and the police. He gave you the full account, eyewitness. We're not playing. We wanted to give black people an example of black power. We wanted to give black people an example of black manhood. And we were willing to fight, kill, bleed, and die in Jasper, Texas. We were willing to fight, kill, bleed, and die on Malcolm X Boulevard. No, brother, I didn't like what my father did to my little brother, Attorney Malik Shabazz like that in front of everyone. I was the first to call the million. We all love you for that. And if you heard the tape, saw Brother Clemson Brown's video or any of the others, or if you were there, you know we gave props to Minister Farrakhan from the beginning to the end. And if you, if you visited our website on the World Wide Web, we invited him. I didn't expect him to come, and I'm nobody's puppy dog. I'm not going to tuck my tail and go sniffing behind. Nobody, Louis Farrakhan, didn't teach me that way. Much of what I am by the power of God and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and what they put in him, he put it in me. And that's the way I'm going to be from here on out. I'm not changing. I got one letter from Minister Farrakhan in five years. One letter in five years, though I had written him. I called him repeatedly, you've heard me talk about it, right at the UAM forum. For years, he set up meetings and postponed the meetings. When I was in the hospital, shot down like a dog, he never visited me. Never sent me a letter, never sent me a postcard, not a penny, not a nickel, not a dime, the whole damn time. I know what happened between Malcolm and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and how Malcolm's letters were being intercepted, how his calls were being intercepted, so I know when to reach my father, so I would call him early in the morning when I knew he would answer the phone, and I would sometimes speak directly to him and he would be just as nice and promise that we would meet and there were no meetings. I stopped doing that and I said everywhere he was going to speak, I would go and sit on the front row or the second row to say, here I am. Will you see me? Can we talk? Can we work this out? I'm, I want to come back. Remember how dedicated I've been Remember how committed I've been, how devoted I've been. Remember, I was with you when your son was not with you. I was with you when your daughters were not with you. I was with you when none of the nation of Islam was with you. Remember me, I'm the one who used to pack two pistols to make sure that nobody would do anything to you. I'm the one who would stand next to you with a gun and a Bible. I'm the one who was willing to take a bullet for you if an enemy stood up to shoot you down. I would sit on the front row, the second row, begging almost, pleading. What in the hell do I look like five years later calling a man saying we're having the Million Youth March? Will you come and help us, please, sir? Hell no. We still invited him because it was the right thing to do. But we don't have to consult you, we consult God and God alone, God damn it. What's the next question? 
Now you know that's a very hard act to follow. <laughs> this is Carol Taylor, The Little Black Book, and I just, as an elder, want to say that in my estimation, you're one of, if not the most brave black man on the planet. All praise is due to our Lord. All praise is due to our Lord. And I want to say that if you and the group in your youth decide to go and get Mumia Abu Jamal, I'm going to. All right. Another subject for another time. <laughs> yes, okay, um, the Caucasian prints the money. So if the billions of black people in the world were to get reparations and an apology, would that improve their lives spiritually and psychologically and so forth? because I have already sent Clinton sample legislation as to an apology. Now, Mother, the, the essence of your question is that if we would get reparations, yes. would that solve our problems psychologically, solve our problems psychologically spiritually, spiritually, and uh, life-wise? And the last one? Well, morally. Yes, ma'am, morally. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, no ma'am. <laughs> well, I <laughs> just put it right there. But if we got reparations, it would not solve our problems, all of our problems, mentally, I mean psychologically, spiritually, morally, politically. Generally, reparations is the process of repairing the damage. But generally, our people think when they think, or when we think of reparations, we think of some Benjamins. We think of some money. No money. Well, let's hope for God in Can do this for us. Let's hope for God in 2001. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last thing she I said. said. Let's hope for God in 2001. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll hope for God in 2001 but I want to say this because you have very wisely filled the atmosphere with something that must be addressed our ancestors who have gone on to the realm of the Egungu would turn over in their graves metaphorically speaking and that's really cheap talk for the ancestors would turn over in their graves if they knew that all we wanted was some worthless paper with some dead Peckerwood president's pictures on it. <laughs> some gold, some silver, some diamonds. When we've lost over 600 million in the Middle Passage, our Holocaust, the African Holocaust, the Black Holocaust, is over 100 times worse than the imposter Jews so-called Holocaust. They are out of their ghettos. They are out of the ghettos of Europe. We are still in the ghettos of the hells of North America. No. Money, trinkets, goodies. You say, well, what about land? Land is not good enough either. We must have, yes, money. We must have Precious metals, yes. We must have land, yes. But we must have our names, our language, our religion, our culture, our God, our folkways, our mores, our norms. We must get back the power of our own being. And then we can't leave this out. Then it must be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a limb for a limb and a goddamn life for a goddamn life. Body, mind. And make sure one of you, this is not silly, ask me about what I said at the end of the Million Youth March. Question me on no good bastard and what a bastard is. Question me on saying God damn. Question me on it. 
before the day is over. As old no good Calvin Butts came on the TV. I would say the two men responsible for this, uh, uh, ev this uh, that happened at the end of the march, Rudolph, Rudolph Giuliani, disgraced us all. And above all, Khalid Muhammad with such vile language embarrassed us all, embarrassed our youth, and embarrassed all of us who consider ourselves clergy. And he's an embarrassment to Islam. Now here's a nigga named Calvin Butts. <laughs> the nigga turns around, don't want me to speak in his church, when Reverend Adam Clayton Powell brought Malcolm to the church. I can't go in the church and speak. But he can bring Pataki in. Endorsed to Peckerwood. Skinning and grinning. He doesn't grin too much at black people. I don't see him smile too much at other black leaders in the black community. And I could see all of the niggas gums when Pataki was there. And some of you were hurt. Some of you were disappointed that he backed Pataki. The nigga's name is Calvin Butts. Don't you know you can't trust a nigga named Butts? <laughs> How you gonna trust a nigga named Butts? Um, back to finishing this. Um, yes, the damage must be repaired. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us of reparations. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey taught us of reparations. Minister Farrakhan has taught of reparations. Uh, Minister Silas Muhammad working on reparations. Reparations in Cobra, working on reparations. One of the planks of the mission statement, key points of the mission statement of the Million Youth March, reparations. But let's not have a narrow concept of just how we can get some money in our pocket. Give us the reparations money, white man will give it to us today and have it back tomorrow. He'd make a special reparations Lexus. <laughs> He'd make a Lexus reparations edition. Get all your reparations money, and then you'd have to pay him $700 a month. You still wouldn't have enough for 36 months. A fool and his money is soon part. Part of reparations is repairing, as Sister said, the psychological, the moral, the spiritual damage. We've been damaged. Read Dr. Amos Wilson, A Blueprint for Black Power. The moral, political, and economic, what? Imperative for the 21st century. I love to read mine. In the past three or four days, I've been to Cleveland, I've been to Dallas, Fort Worth, and Atlanta. You know, it's a book that thick. Not only do some black people run from it, crackers run from it. I like to lay it down on the seat. <laughs> when, the little ugly, when the little ugly white girl stewardess, with a little clothespin nose, and a little ironing board backside, when she comes by to give me my orange juice, I like to have it conveniently in the way so that she has to read it before we move it. It's a must. It's a must. We must get it. The works of Dr. Patricia Newton, some of you know as Dr. Sekhmet, 
Some of you know as Dr. Nana Kosiwa. The works of Dr. Richard King. The works of Dr. Bobby Wright. The works of Dr. Francis Cress Wellesley. The works of Dr. Naeem Akbar. The works of these behavioral scientists in our midst must be read for they let us understand, they help us understand what must be done for reparations or to repair the damage. My brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, black power. I really appreciate everything that you have shared with us. Um, as a member of Millions Forever, a group that you have inspired because of the way you are, you represent um, what Malcolm X would want from all black men in America and abroad. My question to you is this. You brought up the word arrogance, okay? Yes, sir. What about the arrogance of Congress or the United States government in saying no apology for slavery? So if there's no apology for slavery, how can anyone get reparations? I'm so happy that the white man didn't give that kind of clear, firm apology. Attorney Maddox, those of us who work out here on the front lines, Brother Moses Powell, if the white man had given that kind of clear apology, we'd have some hard, hard work to do. Because for some of us, that's all the peck of wood gotta do. All the peck of wood gotta do is say, my fellow Americans, gee whiz, guys. Golly gee, I mean, you know, really, 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 we're so sorry for what has happened to your people. We're sorry, guys. Will you forgive us? Jimenez, will you forgive us? That's all some of us want. What is an apology from the white man? The Pope of Rome giving an apology. I want no damn apology from this old wrinkled faggot that's about to die, stumbling, they gotta hold him up every time he walks. I have no reason to honor the Pope. I have no reason to respect the Pope. When I attack the Pope, you shut your damn mouth if you don't have the courage to attack this cracker. He's an imposter. He's an antichrist. He's nothing to do at all. He has nothing to do at all with God except the enemy or the adversary of God and the righteous. He means nothing to you. Absolutely nothing. Well, we should be polite and respectful of other people's folks' religion. God damn it, I'm at war. If I'm at war, then I attack the enemy at every flank. I don't pretend that his pope is all right with me. These crackers helped in the slave trade. They gave religious pronouncements and edicts that spread all over the world and the so-called imposter Jew rabbinical class and the Talmudic texts along with the Pope helped to legitimize and legalize slavery all over the face of the globe. We don't owe the damn Pope nothing but a kick in his behind. Hope he get a stroke and croak. He's not the Pope of Rome, he's the punk of Rome. If you are a righteous man of God, if you are a righteous woman of God, then your duty is to tear down the idols, bust the idols to pieces, 
The Pope is one of the idols, and his naked, raw, nasty, homosexual, freakish, licentious behind must be snatched down and exposed before the whole world. If your heart is too tender for this, you can't get free. You can't get free holding on to this. You can't go into the 21st century holding on to this. So I hope in measure I have in some way touched on an answer to your question. My brother. Hotel, my brother. Hotel, my brother Rob, and uh, my question is: the original Black Panther Party was the Black Panther Party for community defense. What is the new Black Panther Party about? The same thing. Okay. It was the it was the Black Panther Party for self defense. The Black Panther Party for self defense. And we are the new Black Panther Party for self defense. The goals and the objectives, the goals and the objectives in many ways, Mike, the goals and the objectives are in many ways the same. But the new Black Panther Party leans heavily toward Afrocentrism, an African root, and even in the study of revolution, we study African revolution. I'm not going to put down one cracker, a capitalist cracker, and pick up a communist cracker. A cracker is a cracker is a cracker. I know you got over there in New Jersey, old Imamu Amiri Baraka, who attacked us during the Million Youth March, trying to come with some foolishness about it's not about race, it's about class, it's a class struggle. Shut up, fool. <laughs> then that means that Baraka, and I was talking to Minister Craig, and we were talking about, that means Baraka has no love for his own people. Yeah. He's shifting the focus and the emphasis from black, from Africa, from race to class. If it's a class problem, wherever the black-white dynamic exists, then the white is the upper class and the black is the lower class. And your lower class is much lower than white folks' lower class. And your upper class ain't nowhere near the top of the white upper class. If you are communist, the white communist is on top, black communist is on the bottom. If you're a socialist, the white socialist is on top, the black socialist is on the bottom. Huh? If you're a Christian, the white Christian is on top, the black Christian is on the bottom. If you're a Jew or a Hebrew, the white Jew is on top, the black Jew is on the bottom. If you're a Muslim, the white Muslim is on top, the black Muslim is on the bottom. Whatever the social, political, economic, academic, religious, spiritual system or order is, wherever the black-white dynamic exists, you'll find the white on top and the black on the bottom. Evilly, wickedly, and viciously on the top. An inordinate white superiority and an inordinate black inferiority. Huh? That's real. Class. No, when we look at this carefully, we will have to do away with all of the, the old images that we have held on to. What was the other dimension to, uh, where's our brother, he disappeared on us. There he is. You can say it from right there, I can even, the, the other dimension to it. I hit in, honed in on that part so hard. What was the other dimension to your question? Yes, I was uh, going further to point out that we could not follow Trotsky, Lenin, 
We could not follow uh, Marx. Can't follow them. These are not from an African or a black paradigm. They didn't care nothing about us. They weren't studying us. So though we may draw from some of the positive aspects of Miles' little red book, all of it came from Sister Carol, our little black book. Yeah. And we have to understand that. So the new Black Panther Party will indeed this go around be a black Panther Party. We're not chasing no white women. Trying to put a black beret on a white woman's head? Yes. Now listen. No. Bobby Seale has attacked us. He said at Cleveland State University, Khalid Muhammad wants to start a race war. The, and he said, we're not with that. That the old Black Panther Party has nothing to do with the new Black Panther Party. He said, Khalid Muhammad running around talking about fighting white folks and a revolution killing white man. He said, the old Black Panther Party is not about that. We're working to build a global humanistic society. <laughs> but some of the old Panthers are with us, backing us up, working with us. My sister. I respect you, Dr. Muhammad. Vile, vile. Uh, I respect I you. Say, Same uh, to you. Is, uh, I need to know from you uh, as to whether or not you condemn me for my feelings, and that is this. First of all, I want to ask you, uh, will women be allowed to join the uh, new Black Panther Party? I will not condemn you for your question, sister. I don't want to go nowhere where there ain't no women. <laughs> I'm not with Mayor Giuliani and Commissioner Safer. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Uh, this is something I, I need to hear from you because uh, I constantly get condemned for this just yes, about on a daily basis. But this is truly my soul and my heart. Yes, I truly feel that the U.S. government should be overthrown. One. And the next thing is, is that uh, <clears throat> I truly feel and believe that a large percentage of our people will have to be eliminated along with that process, because many of them are beyond repair. I'm sorry if that offends, but that's my feeling. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! All right. Well, my sister, well, my dear strong sister, is her name Sister Tina? That's right. America does have to be indeed destroyed. There must be the white man and America's demise if we are to rise. Stop talking about it's the system. You got Negroes, it's the system. If we could just change the system. Lord, it is Lord, have mercy, Lord, child, Lord, Jesus. It's the system. That's like a damn fool walking around talking about, it ain't the spider, it's the spider web. It's the spider web. If we could just tear the spider web down, everything would be all right. What the hell, fool, don't you know if you tear a white spider web down and don't deal with the spider, then the spider's gonna weave another web as soon as you tear that one down? It's not the system. It's not the spider web. It's the white spider. It's the white man. I just told you it makes no difference what kind of system it is. So America must be destroyed. I told you my favorite book is The Fall of America by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I fast and pray for that day that we have waited for for over, what, 379 years. Huh? 
I want to see in my lifetime. If I can't see it in my lifetime, I want to see it through my baby's eyes or my baby's 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 eyes. I want to see it. I want to see the fall of the white man. I want to see the fall of America. I, I pray for my enemy every day. I, I pray that God will kill my enemy yeah. every day. See a brother walking and a sister walking with white folks? They don't know what I'm saying. I say to the brother and sister, God bless you. And to the cracker, I say, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. They say, oh, thank you. <laughs> don't know what I say. <laughs> well, sister, let's get to your second point. She said that some of us are going to have to die with the white man. It's true. Some of us will die protecting the white man. Some of us will fight God over the white man. And brothers, the white woman too. When we say the white man is the devil, we don't just mean the white man. The white woman is the devil too. Yes, some of us will. The scripture says that the old generation had to die out in the wilderness. And a new generation had to be born that would go on to the promised land. But before we could go to the promised land, we had to go through the Red Sea. And the most honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches that the Red Sea represents war, bloodshed, and revolution. War, bloodshed, and revolution. We have to go through the Red Sea, but some of our own have to be drowned with this modern day Pharaoh. Some of our own have to go down with the white man. Some of them are hopeless, irredeemable, incorrigible, past praying for. I believe that Jesse Jackson is one of them. I, 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 I'm so sorry, but I believe that Jesse Lewis Jackson is one of them that will have to be destroyed with the white man. What after NAFTA except more white folks laughter? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let's give a hand to Brother Moses. I mean, Brother Powell. I'm thinking of someone. Brother Powell, who's here on the front lines for us with the Pan-African Pioneer Movement, following in the footsteps of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the Honorable Carlos Cook. Yeah, Morris Moses Powell. That's, that's true. It is Moses Powell. Yeah, I thought I had it yeah. right. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I can't think of a better role model for our youth than yourself. All praises be to Allah. So brother, brother Khalid have everything our youth need to have. They need to embody your spirit. We wouldn't have no problem. Uh, what I have here is a plan behind the Million Youth March. I was very disgusted and really disgusted about the way this faggot behaved down at Silly Hall. And we have, I came up with the idea that we should start closing down stores. And we're gonna, we're gonna move as close as November the 20th. That'll be on a Friday. And when you pick a store, you wanna pick the ones that did us the most harm. And Fred is, is operating big out there. I understand, I know of two stores, but I understand he has three stores. So, uh, Everybody know Uptown Jeans is there. And as you recall, Abby Gandhi lost his life in that store. Yes, sir. And seven of his employees. Yes, sir. Those seven people could have had been saved, but the, the wounded white manager saved the white bookkeeper and let the rest of them die in there. So uh, 
we're going to close them down and just start there, and all hell going to break loose. Because if we can't live out here, we ain't going to see nobody else live out here. Yep. We're going to just jump on it and let the chips fall where they may. I wrote this fly out and uh, started off poetic with it. Fred is not dead. His business is, in, is not in the red. Fred is alive and kicking, and the black community is taking a licking. Have you heard, have you heard, Fred is where the massacre occurred. Freddie is an oppressor. <clears throat> we wonder who is his successor. It's Uptown Jeans and others. They must go and they will go. We are calling for the complete boycott of all non-black businesses on 125th Street and throughout the black communities at large. The concerned citizens of, of the Harlem Committee and the black communities throughout New York City in response to the police occupation of Harlem on September the 5th, 1998, Million Youth March, we will start picking in uptown jeans at 272 West 125th Street starting Friday, November the 20th, 1998. Join us at 9 a.m. sharp. Give us that date again, it's Brother on, Moses Powell. That's the, uh, it's uh, November the, it's Friday, November the 20th, 1998 at 9 a.m. Friday, November the 20th at 9 a.m. Friday, what is it? 20th. At what time? What day of the week? Friday. What month? Friday. What day? Friday. What time? Friday. Where? 272? 272. 272, 125th Street, right up Town right next to Record Shack. Re record Jeans, Shack. right there next to uh, Shangay. Shangay record, record Shack. Yes, Shangay Record Shack. Yeah. And down below, I end it with its own. As its you own. Recall, as you recall, how many of us will join with Brother Powell in shutting down Freddie's Uptown Jeans on 125th Street and send the cracker back where it came from? Let me see your fists in the air. We will have to be organized. We will have to, we've done it before and we've worked out there together with strategies on these crackers on 125th Street and with a relentless day-to-day -day coordinated uh, momentum that we can build and build and build, we can shut this cracker down. We can shut him down. Thank you, Brother Powell, and let us make sure that we back this vision that has come to our brothers, divine, and we must back it up. Yes. Uh, greetings. And on, greetings, just on, the, uh, on the note of Brother Moses Powell, my name is Kepita, publisher of the Black Track, and Brother Moses, the Black Track features only black business. No vodka ads, no General Mills, none of that. It's all black business, so this is... This is what, what we're trying to do, promote our people to, you know, to support our own. So that's what, that's, we're in harmony with that. I just want to say again, greetings, uh, brothers and sisters of the United African Movement. I already spoke to Dr. Khalid, and we're going to be in communications more, but I felt it appropriate to, you know, speak as a youth, because this, you know, this is in light of after the Million Youth March. Now, um, I love Love you, Dr. Khalid, as Vila, for, Vila. as, as um, attorney um, automatic for speaking outright for our community. You know, strong black leadership is what we need. And um, one of the issues that I did have with the Million Youth March was that I was concerned that young brothers and sisters who don't have, the, who didn't have the opportunity, maybe to know you and to know how much information that you have and all that you have backing you in terms of history and the, the wealth of knowledge that you sit on, that I was concerned that they might not get an opportunity to hear that. I stand on. And, um, you know, and they might not get an opportunity to hear that, and it would be more uh, hearing about our oppressor, which we hear about so much. I was concerned that there might not be, a, you know, they might not hear about programs for empowerment. But I would like to say that um, since the march, Dr. Khalid has been in communications 
He is, you know, um, he was just honored recently by Sunrise Sun. So people, brothers and sisters in the other community can know what's going on afterwards. Because you might not know if you don't have things like your media, which we can only do so much. You might not know what's going on. You know, he was honored the other evening, and it was a very long program. And I like to give Brother to Hood Nine, and it's worthy of some respect for throwing a program to honor our strong black leaders, like uh, Dr. Mad uh, Brother Maddox, Dr. Khalid, so many others. Because if they may not be who's fashionable or, or popular, but that's, that's right. And as I'm here in the United African Movement, Dr. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call him Dr. Maddox, because he's a doctor to me, uh, Brother Maddox is a strong black leader, but he may not be so popular that you see him on the front covers of all of our newspapers, but he's on the front cover of the black track. But just to say that, you know, to him fighting the, the battle with Tawana Brawley is a battle about more than Tawana Brawley. That's a fight for all of us. That's a fight for me and my newspaper. Uh, you know, the fight that they fought in Poughkeepsie for us to have freedom of speech. You know, we have to know about this. So um, I just wanted to say that. But let me, let me go on back to, back to my point. Um, I wanted to say that, um, Again, Dr. Khalid is in communications. He stressed his interest to uh, see how we can network and communicate. And that's just one-on-one -on -one to say, sister, I like what you're doing. We need to work together. So that's what is taking place. I just want to share that with the community. And you know, and I'll leave you on that note in peace. <laughs> well, Brother Tahut, I want that whole front row there, that entire conscious posse to be a part of that circle of um, leadership and we want to begin to do that kind of serious organizing here and take it all across the country because we're getting ready to do Attorney Malik Shabazz and I and many others so we want to make sure that we are all together as we organize our boroughs here and as we move across the country with the same uh, thrust. Black Power. Black Power. Brother, sir. I honor you, I respect <coughs> you, most of all I salute you. I have a question, it's a burning question that I've wanted to ask you personally for a while. I'm going to ask you publicly now. Recently, uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan was on Meet the Press. He alluded to a letter that he sent uh, President Clinton. Uh, you were one of his strongest supporters, and still are, and one of his top ministers and soldiers. Could you give us an idea, a clue, or inclination what he possibly may have said in that letter? What Minister Farrakhan said in his letter That's to correct. Bill Clinton? Do you have an idea? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've I've never I've never written a letter like that to a devil. I don't I don't know what you put in a letter like that to a beast like Clinton. Um, Did you think he threatened him? Did you think he pleaded with him? Did you think? Do I feel he? Threatened him? Do I feel he possibly threatened him? Gave him some advice? I can speak strongly and boldly on some things, but a, a private letter between Minister Farrakhan and old no good Bill Clinton, I, 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 I couldn't speak of. Would you have written a letter to Bill Clinton? Well, well, no, 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 no. It's now. It's no holes barred now. I just have to be wise enough to deal with his questions. And by God's grace, I think I am. I'm going to leave that alone. Okay. Thank you. No, that's like making a comparison between my spiritual father and me. It's like um, putting me in a position that I don't like to be in. To say, well, would you have written him a letter like that? Uh, I, I won't speak to that at all. Okay. Uh, greetings, Minister Khalid. Uh, I respect you. Uh, but since the Million Youth March, there's some questions that's been bothering me. Number one, I'm concerned about why was your address so short? And why did you wait so long to come on? Uh, number two, I'm concerned about the, do you believe that the police uh, over, over control the, the streets? And uh, number, number three, it's um, dealing with uh, one more question, Andy. Well, let's let's. let's okay, well, one more I had there. Well, well, let me let me deal, let me deal with those. <laughs> what was the first one? Why was my speech so short? So brief. Right? <laughs> well, 
I did not intend to speak this March at all. Every youth that was not on the program that, you know, we had a 12-hour program that was cut to 12, and every youth that wanted to speak, and every elder that I thought, that I thought had a positive message that the youth needed to hear, whether they were on the program or not, as they kept coming to the stage, kept coming to the stage. Some of them really, really wanted to speak, and I kept pushing them to the mic, sending them to the mic. The time was passing, the time was passing, and I came up with the decision that I was not going to speak, that the devil, the white man, that his media would come out saying that we waited for this hate speech all day long, and Khalid Muhammad didn't say a mumbling word at the Million Youth March. I didn't feel that I had to speak that day. I felt that the work spoke for itself. I felt that the overwhelming success of the, the, the Million Youth March spoke for itself. We fought opposition on a daily and consistent basis. It was a protracted struggle. And we won at every point and on every level to shut down the subways, to keep our people from coming. After they filled up, it was supposed to be three more blocks added to that. Fill up that area, three more blocks added to that. The devils were gonna make sure that they controlled the propaganda so that they controlled the numbers of the crowd. They were gonna turn away thousands upon thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of our people at all of the cross streets and again affect the attendance by shutting down the subways. They wanted to do all of that, so I was not going to speak. Brother Attorney Malik Shabazz and I went back and forth on the stage about that. He kept saying, but you have to speak. We gotta save at least an hour for you. I said, well, we don't have but four hours. I can't take an hour. He said, well, at least 30 minutes. This is going on back and forth on the stage. He said, I'm not gonna call anybody else. I'm going to call you. I said, if you call me, I'm just going to call all these brothers and sisters standing in line here on the stage. He said, but the people will be hurt if you don't speak. I said, trust me. Let's go with it this way where I don't speak at all. About 10 or 15 minutes or whatever time it was, I don't really know. We can time the time. Before 4 o'clock, we were very aware of 4 o'clock. They came to me telling me about a helicopter in the distance. Someone came to me and told me about some kind of bomb squad and some kind of armored tank and armored vehicle in Central Park on 110th Street behind the stage. Somebody came to me and told me about the, 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 uh, the riot horse squad. They use horses because of the height of the horses, because of the size of the horse's muscles and the strength of the horse, and they train the horses with the Move by moving the horse a certain way with the sweep of the horse's body. Horses can take down 20 and 25 or 30 people or more at one time. They told me about a major contingent, a major riot contingent behind the stage in full riot gear. I went to the back and looked out of the back. I couldn't see all the way to 110th Street. I had to take their word about whatever armored vehicles or bomb tanks or squads uh, that were there, I looked and saw the paddy wagons backed up to the stage, and they opened the doors wide as if to say, we're going to fill these uh, paddy wagons up with some niggas here today. Then I heard that they had barges out on the East River that were to be detention uh, or holding uh, uh, centers, and that they intend to hold some underground in the subway as it was closed down, as Brother Steve Coakley has pointed out and given us evidence of. So when I heard all of this, I did not, as God is my witness and the ancestors are my witness, including my mother and father and all, I did not intend to speak at all. I didn't get up there to give an address. I didn't give up to give a keynote speech. I got up to take charge as a soldier, as a general, to take charge of what was going on. Immediately, I switched from former national spokesman training, former minister training, I switched back to supreme captain. All of my training in the Nation of Islam as a supreme captain 
and my great teacher who has gone on to the realm of the Egun or the ancestors, Captain Ali Rashid, all of their training kicked in right then. I knew how Captain Rashid would handle it. So much of him is still in me. And so immediately, I said, I have to take charge. I thought about City College. I thought about how we had trampled and stampeded each other at City College in a panic. I thought about rap concerts where we had stampeded and trampled each other and even killed each other. And so I said, that can't happen here today. And so when I took the mic, I opened, of course, in the name of God, I was happy that Sister Oyafumike, Sister Oyafumike of Sankofa, the star of Sankofa, had come up and told the devil she was going to juju them. She was going to voodoo them. And she poured libation and went into some Yoruba on them. I was happy that Professor James Small and the great Babaloi who was with him how they, I could see as they released the salt that blew across the stage and out into the crowd when they did the, uh, uh, the uh, poured the libation and did the opening uh, uh, Yoruba, uh, uh, the opening Yoruba session. And so the ancestors were with us. And so as God is my witness, something took hold of me. Another power took hold of me. When I went back and listened to that and looked at it over and over again, I couldn't have planned what I said the way I said it and hooked it up the way I said it. I don't think in my real conscious mind with me in control. And so when I went to the podium, before I got there, you saw me hit the podium. I'm mad as hell that this beast is ready to attack. It was not going to be the million youth farce, as Malcolm called it, the farce on Washington. And some of you have attacked me, talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King, when Dr. King went out, Dr. King had nonviolent marches. You a lie. Dr. King didn't have no nonviolent marches. Dr. King was the only one who was nonviolent. The white man was never nonviolent. They spilled their blood. They sick vicious dogs on them. Four-legged dogs sicked on them by even more vicious two-legged dogs. Water hoses were turned loose on our people. Cattle prods they used to drag them down the streets. Their blood was on the, is still drenched in the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Huh? They beat the hell out of John Lewis there that day. Congressman John Lewis. Probably why he's so damn crazy today. That's right. Beat the hell out of John Lewis there. Let me finish. I thought about all of this. I said, this is a black power rally. We're not out here to sing no, we shall overcome. Hell no, we shall overrun. Not no lift every voice and sing. Hell no, lift every fist and swing. So I said to the youth, immediately I said, I told them what was going on. I said, down the middle, they're lining up. They're lining up in the trenches. They're doing this. And if you can see around the stage, in full riot gear, the riot troops are lining up. They are preparing. Then I went on to talk about in self-defense. In self-defense. Self-determination. You have a God-given right to defend yourselves. I didn't tell them to just go and jump on the cracker. But if I had told him to do that, God damn it, I still would have been right. But I didn't say that. I told them in self-defense. I said, look these bastards straight in the eyes. I wanted to steal the crowd. I wanted to remove any fear that was in the crowd. I wanted them to prepare right then to deal. We were pinned in like animals, like horses, like cows like cattle. I turned to them. I said, decide right now where you are. Who will disconnect the barricades? Who will connect the rails? And if they attack you, disconnect the railing and get to beating the hell out of them when they attack you with the rail. 
And that's what they did, too. I saw it on the news. They were whipping some police behind with those rails and barricades. I went on to say, hey, here's the cracker. He's not going to just shoot my people down in cold blood. No Soweto. No Tiananmen Square. That's square. I said, if you don't have your own gun, some of them have one gun, two guns, three guns. Some of them a shoulder holster, one gun, two guns, three guns. I said, if they attack you in self-defense, some of you running around, well, he was wrong. He shouldn't have told them to take the, Lord, he shouldn't have told them, Lord, have mercy, Lord, child, Lord, Jesus. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. He shouldn't have told them to take them police's guns. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. I said if they come to take your life with those guns, I said take their goddamn guns from them and use their guns on them. Now what's wrong with that? I said, if they come to beat you with their nightsticks, take their nightsticks the way they did Brother Abner Louima and ram it up their behinds and jam it down their goddamn throats. I wasn't up there to be polite. I wasn't up there to be nice. I wasn't up there to tiptoe through the tulips. I wasn't up there to what they call a genuflect and curtsy. I wasn't up there to say, now, boys and girls, it appears that they are preparing behind the stage. And like some Negro leader, now y'all, y'all, old butts would have told them, y'all, y'all, be calm. We don't want to act like them. We don't want to stoop to their level. That's what they want us to do. No, my purpose was to keep our people from being hurt. When the helicopter swooped, with a Vietnam swoop, straight down over the head of the crowd, heads of the crowd. If you'll notice me on the video, I don't hold my head up and look at the helicopter. Why? Ali Rashid's training, Captain Rashid's training, I couldn't look up at the helicopter. If I looked up at the helicopter, then the crowd would have looked up at the helicopter. And then maybe it would have caused so much panic and fear when they made that Vietnam swoop that the crowd would have scattered and they would have dropped the tear gas canisters right in the open field on Malcolm X Boulevard. So when the helicopter swooped, I didn't look up. I wouldn't let you look up. When the helicopter swooped, I said, Black Power! And I started the chant of black power, and everybody got caught up in the spirit of black power. And nobody looked up, nobody panicked. And people started gritting their teeth. Our people started getting mad. They weren't scared. They started getting mad. Giuliani has already said he gave the order. There were ground troops, there were lieutenants, there were captains that didn't know what the hell was going on with white shirts on and brass all on their shoulders. We got video footage where police were fighting police. That's no exaggeration. We'll come, Brother Steve has it. We got footage in Cleveland, Ohio. We got footage from out west, our own footage. We got Brother Clemson Brown's comprehensive footage and detail. Policemen fighting policemen. Some black policemen broke down and cried out there that day. Some of them said, why are they doing this? What are you doing? Some of the black police jumped in the way and pushed other policemen, grabbed policemen, started tussling matches with the riot troops that were coming toward us. We got it all on video, no exaggeration, and we don't have to stretch it. You can see it easily what's going on. Only a special attack unit on a need-to-know basis had been given a certain signal and a certain order. 
And when the helicopter swooped, that was the order to the special forces to attack. Giuliani said, I gave the order, and I'm proud that I gave the order. Now come after me. We're going to get at you, dog. We're going to get at you, dog. The next question, let me cover it all while I'm dealing yeah, with Minister it. Minister Khaled, um, the securing of a permit. Hold, um, hold, hold, hold that point. I'm, I'm, we'll get to the permit and all that stuff. All right. The next question. And I, wow, I got it right here. Some of you asked the question. Uh, Chris Rock was the first damn fool. Had it on TV, on the Chris Rock show. Say they call it Muhammad with the Million Youth March. He told them to stick the sticks up the policemen's behinds, and and you know how he. He looked like Mighty Mouse, or <laughs> Mickey Mouse or something. And he'd do that little silly thing. And he's saying, but I looked and Khalid Muhammad wasn't sticking no sticks. He wasn't ramming nothing. He say, he looked up and said, oh, shit, the police. Uh, I would help y'all, but I got a flight to catch in 20 minutes. He said, at least stick your tongue out at him or something silly for him to say this is the this is the Jew York Post this is the Jew York Post here it is me right in the middle of the crackers and a hell of a karate stance right in the middle all of the security now this is what you have to understand I did not have control over myself when the police attacked. When you're in a position that I'm in, see, most of you don't understand that and don't know that. That's why those of you who have said that make such silly statements. I've been in situations with Minister Farrakhan before at banquets, packing, and he didn't even know I'm packing. And a fight broke out at the table at the banquet. Brother Reginald Eves and others were there. And we, were, we had just got through talking about what happened at the Audubon Auditorium Sunday, February 21st, 1965, when they had the diversionary tactic and, the, you know, get everybody's attention, get out of my pocket. And everybody focuses on that, and then death runs down the aisles. So we had already briefed the security on that. And so when the fight broke out at the table at the banquet and plates started flying, glasses started flying, silverware. We thought that was to take everybody's attention and that they were going to make a hit on Minister Farrakhan. So I'm his security. I don't have time to talk to the man that I have had such awesome respect for. I don't have time to say, uh, Brother Minister, would you please come and go with me, please, sir? It looks like they might be planning to kill you, sir. I don't have time. I'm security. So when the fight breaks out, immediately, I snatch him up from the table, like off of his feet, snatch him up from the table. There's no door behind the head table. I start for the back, back him against the wall. I don't feel safe there. I don't have time to converse with him and talk to him. I snatch him again and take him and throw him in the corner. And I back up in the, with him behind me and pull my stuff in the corner. When a situation like that happens, when I got shot, when the gunfire started, security is trained. They don't wait to ask me questions. One brother hit me low, another brother hit me high, another brother covered my body on the ground. When the police attacked, we weren't on the stage. We weren't on the steps. We were about at the last step on the ground. I'm trying to jump right in the middle of it. There's several of you, Brother Barry and others, who were there and know what happened. I'm saying all the time, and I can't stand up in the public and lie, if there are men who know what happened back there. They would say, oh, that nigga lying, man. I'm jumping right in the middle of it. That's nose to nose on that one. They snatched the hell out of me. You can see them putting their hands on me now to snatch. They said, no. They will kill you. They came to kill you. I'm saying we can't leave our people. We got to fight these bastards. 
they snatched the hell out of me. All these strong brothers. I get to fighting with them. There's a sister. I didn't see her last time I was here when Brother Steve Coakley spoke. She had pictures in the audience where they had taken my coat off of me, twisted me, and trying to t hold my arms behind my back. If you read Peter Noel's account in the daily, in the, uh, not daily challenge, that's our paper, though, with Naya Arenda. In the uh, Village Boys, they wrestle me to the ground. Then they take my legs out from me so I can't really kick. So I say, I'll relax. Fighting is going on. I relax. And they relaxed. I knew they would. And they relaxed. And I broke her loose from them again and dashed right back into the heat of the battle. They grabbed me again, all of them. By this time, members of the crowd joined them. Members of the crowd joined them and said, we can't lose you, brother. Call it. We can't lose you. They want to kill you. We got to get you out of here. So they started muscling me out of the crowd. I'm fighting them instead of fighting the police, really, because I felt for some reason, I don't know if it was accurate or not, that I was the only one who could somehow make a difference, <laughs> but, you know, that I could control both sides and the attack and the intensity of it and all of that, and that's where I wanted to be. But security's job in a situation like that, if something happens in here, these security men are not supposed to leave Attorney Maddox on his own. I don't care how powerful a leader he is. I don't care how strong and powerful his command is. They are supposed to get, when gunfire breaks out in here, they're supposed to clear him from this stage, secure him by any means necessary, even if he doesn't agree with them, that's their job, to take him from harm's way. That's the duty of security. I know because I have been security, and I have trained security, but they took me by surprise. They, the crowd and the security almost suffocated me, trying to get me out of there, and me out of breath, trying to fight them to stay in the thick of it. Finally, they take me up through Malcolm X to 119th Street. Then we get on top of a car and start trying to direct the flow with a bullhorn and everything we could to get the people out of there. Um, that's it. I didn't actually get into a vehicle until we crossed 125th Street. The crowd kept following me. I kept telling them to go home. I don't know if any of you were in that crowd or not. I kept saying, go home. And the people kept saying, we're not going home until you go home. We're not going to leave you. A brother who came up in a car and gave the greeting. He said, Assalamu alaikum. We said, Wa alaikum salam, brother. So everybody said, can he get in your car? He looked at me. He looked at the people. He said, uh-uh. And uh, <laughs> he said, uh-uh. You can't get in here. And so I, I'm still in charge. I spared him. Meaning, what do I mean? I mean, I smoothed it over. I said, oh, I understand, brother. I said, that's all right. I said, brother's okay. Because the least frown from me, that crowd was angry. They were with me. They would have tore that brother to pieces and turned his car over. A van came, some brothers from Richmond, Virginia, came in a van on 126 or 127th Street and jumped out and said, put him in here. Then they put me in their van, but the crowd, I'm not exaggerating on any of this at all, didn't want me to leave, so they started rocking the brother's van. I said, are you going to turn the man's van over? So I said, we all said, brothers and sisters, back up. And he eased and eased, and then he was able to pull away. Helicopters followed us then for about 10 to 12 blocks. We thought it was the police, but it's the same thing. It was news helicopters. Followed us forever, and then they finally cut us loose. I left there, those of you who were with me and know, I went straight to Harlem Hospital because I heard that one of our men was at the hospital. He had been sprayed in the face by Mace, Brother Ja, 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 from, from the Black Power Organizing Committee in New Jersey. 
So I went straight to the hospital. I got there, all the black policemen hugged me, happy to see me. One policewoman kissed me. Dr. Barbara Justice was there. They took me, she had her medical team with her. When I went straight from there to the hospital, they took me on in immediately to see Brother Ja. He had a, a big hickey, a, a knot on his head. He said that one cracker had pulled his gun that he saw, and he fought him over the gun. Brother Cleve is here tonight, who trains him in the martial arts. He gave big props, Brother Cleve, to you and the training that you've given to him over in New Jersey in the martial arts. And he talked about how that saved his life and how that really helped him in that crowd. Now that's, that's what happened. Now brother brought up the issue of permit. And I, I, I kind of know why it was brought up. It was said that from this forum, that it was said that we should never have sought a permit, that we didn't have no business going to get no permit and all of that. I'm dealing with a mass mobilization. And that mass mobilization had all kinds of opinions. If you're moving a handful of people, you can pretty much control that. But many people were saying, I ain't going. If they ain't got no permit, I ain't going. I'm not going out there. We said we were going with or without a permit. So I call myself, in order to attract a broader base of our people, crossing and dealing with what Minister Farrakhan had said in the Final Call newspaper when he had dissed the march here and praised the one in Atlanta, which turned out to be a flop, with all of what Brother Steve Coakley calls all of the civil rights all-stars, and they still fail. Martin Luther King III, Jesse Jackson, Kwesi Mfume, Joseph Lowry, the backing of Minister Farrakhan and Nation of Islam all over the place. Coca-Cola sign on the stage. That's the headquarters for Coca-Cola that backed the Atlanta March. AFL-CIA, National Council of Negro Women. All of them backed it, and they didn't have 800 people the full day. When Jesse Jackson spoke, they didn't have even 400 people in front of it. They were all embarrassed because that said, Brother Maddox, and I'm almost finished, that said that the people were not with that civil rights Uncle Tom bootlicking stuff. They were with black power in New York. So we went after the permits so that we were doing what Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan had said, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. That's all we were doing because many would not have even gotten out there with us if there had not been a permit. Would have been too scared. Wasn't going to be but a few of us out there when they, if, they, if we hadn't won in the federal court and then won the appeal. Wasn't going to be but a few out there with us. But we had to go forward. So that was the purpose of applying for the permit. What's wrong with applying for the permit? We won the federal court case, a landmark decision, the judge said that New York City had no real system, no real method, no real statutes in, on the book that actually applied properly to uh, obtaining a permit. So he said that just uh, with, an, with ad hoc decision making, that they would just make up things as they go. He said all of this in the open court. And he went on to talk about how, uh, how a breathtaking it was with the lack of standard in granting permits. So we set the precedent, the case that they used for us was um, uh, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham. Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham. But now, Million Youth March, I'm sure, versus New York uh, City, uh, Million Youth March versus New York, has set a new standard in terms of our landmark decision when it deals with permits, obtaining permits in the city of New York. They appealed on the federal level, and we were able to be victorious on the federal level. So, I mean, that was the purpose, just like we do anything. That was the purpose. Just like we'll fight a case in court. We could just say to hell with this cracker, I'm not going to court. I'm not going to argue no case in court. 
the cracker ain't gonna give me no justice in here. No, in no way, so to hell with the cracker. I'm not gonna file no case in the cracker's court. Or just like we would do where it's an academic situation, or if it's a religious situation. That's the same thing we did for the Million Youth March, and we were victorious by God's grace. Yes, sir. Salaam alaikum, Dr. Khan. Walaikum salam. Uh, Brothers question. and sisters, let's don't add anyone else to this line. This is the end. Brother said he got it. My question was regards to the uh, Million uh, Man March anniversary at Howard University, in which uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, referred to the Pope as His Holiness, and uh, also President Clinton as the savior uh, of America. And I had to put it out there. You know, it's, well, it, it struck me as a surprise. I was in the audience. It really hurt me. You were at Howard University? Yes, sir. And he called the Pope what? His Holiness. Does that mean holes are in the cracker? Or what? <laughs> well, <laughs> what does it mean? And he uh, referred to Clinton as what? As the savior. The savior the of savior. black people or America? He said savior of America. Nobody can save America. Nobody. I'll just leave it at that because I've already spoken on the Pope earlier. And I've spoken on the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum in the Bible and how uh, America cannot be saved and the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad on the fall of America. And, and one last question with regards to what... Uh, took place in Philadelphia as it relates to what happened in Chicago with a young brother being beat down uh, near the White Sox Stadium in Chicago. A lot of religious people have kind of sold out on the issue and uh, have kind of like turned the other way with regards to that brother being beat down to death in Chicago. And uh, the brothers uh, in California have informed me uh, that, you know, they, they plan on moving with this at the National uh, uh, Youth Gang Summit in Kansas City. They want to take this issue all away and press for some justice here in Chicago, what happened with the young brother. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of religious leaders are backing out. Like the only protest. justice for what happened in Chicago is not to be pressed for in the courts alone. Those who want to use the court system, I think it was Lorraine Hansberry that said, fight every way that you can, every way you feel. Those who want to fight in the courts, fight in the courts. You want to get a permit for the Million Youth March, fight in the courts, get a permit. She said, fight. Those who want to march, march. She says, and others can shoot from their windows, Lorraine Hansberry said, Barry said. So she says, everybody fight the same enemy in whatever way you can fight. And ultimately, we will come to some common uh, grounds on how we should fight this beast. So uh, those who want to do that, certainly. But if it's a gang summit, the best way to answer what happened to the young brother in Chicago near the stadium is for some of the brothers and sisters from the gang to go there and uh, hold court themselves. Yes, sir. Hotel, brother. Hotel. If, uh, if we may uh, go back a few years. We only have one more, brother. If we may go back a few years, we reported that uh, Muammar Gaddafi had offered Farrakhan a billion dollars. And also, it was alleged by Dr. Clark, God rest his soul, and others down at a farm in Philadelphia, similar to this one, to that billion dollars offered to me and Farrakhan to broker a slave deal between Maritan Maritanian and the Sudan. Oh yeah, let's do stop, let's, let's stop, let's stop. Oh, let's do that in parts. He says that Muammar Gaddafi offered Minister Farrakhan a billion dollars. He says that uh, Dr. Clark, uh, who has gone on to the ancestors and some others, uh, intimated that uh, inferred or whatever that that uh, Minister Farrakhan and this billion dollars from Gaddafi was uh, possibly to broker a deal, a slave deal between Mauritania and who? Between uh, the Sudan. Mauritania running slaves out of Mauritania to Mauritania the Sudan. and Sudan. When I look. Now where it's time to be hard on my spiritual father, I can do that. But that sounds silly to me. I do not believe Minister Farrakhan would be involved in no damn silly slave deal with Mauritania and Sudan. I don't give a damn who said it. It does not make sense to me. What would Minister Farrakhan look like brokering a slave deal with Mauritania and Sudan? That doesn't with the Muslims of Mauritania and Sudan. 
What? And Gaddafi is footing the bill. I think sometimes niggas just get drunk. I don't mean you. No, I, I'm unless you are drunk. No, but I'm. <laughs> I'm not taking that. I'm talking about the ones who told you that. No, I'm not. Huh? That's buck wild. No. That's off the hook. <laughs> Straight up. A slave deal for a billion dollars. No, no, I got a part what, what, What's the other okay. part, brother? And give me, give me a break on this one. Right, to your best of your knowledge, could you explain to us what you know, what the billion dollars was offered for? I'm sorry. To the best of your knowledge, could you explain to us what the billion dollars was offered for? To the best of my knowledge, I can because from the beginning I was involved. I'm responsible by God's grace for Minister Farrakhan and Brother Muammar Gaddafi meeting. When I was married, when I was married uh, to my son uh, Farrakhan's mother, we took our own money and went to Libya, the Libya, Libyan Arab Jamaharia. We went to Libya. We stayed there three months to get a meeting with Brother Muammar al-Qaddafi. We had our letters and all of our correspondence in English on one side, translated in Arabic on the other side. We went to every office, every government building, every military office. We went all over and we hung in there. We took audio tapes, videotapes, and looked for those who had the American system or the dual system to play the videos of Minister Farrakhan. We did everything to get a meeting between Minister Farrakhan and uh, Brother Gaddafi because Minister Farrakhan had sought a meeting with him years back. And when he arrived in Libya to meet with Gaddafi, Gaddafi's plane was taking off. There was a miscommunication and something had happened and they missed each other. So I was dedicated to the two of them meeting. And I stayed in there and laid in there until God helped me to set up the base and the foundation for the five million dollars that came to Minister Farrakhan. I did the work of cutting down the underbrush, paving the way, and opening up the way for the five million dollars. And I've traveled all throughout Africa with money for the black nation, the nation of Islam. I've traveled with money in my socks stacks of money in my underwear, money everywhere, going through the jungles to deliver money across the border as God is my witness, on little motor scooters, everything. So I have some feeling for that relationship. Brother Gaddafi wants to see black people set up a nation of our own because he has studied the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And his book, in his book, called the uh, Green Book, dealing with the third universal theory. In Arabic, it's called Al-Kitab Al-Aqdar. And in Al-Kitab Al-Aqdar, the Green Book, I was blessed to be a, present, a presenter at the third universal theory uh, world or international uh, Al-Kitab Al-Aqdar Green Book uh, Symposium. One of the theories of Muammar al-Qaddafi is that blacks will rule the world again. That's in his third universal theory. And others presented their papers on other aspects of the third universal theory. I was the first and probably the last to present my paper on blacks ruling the world. It is now translated in French journals, Spanish, German, English, Japanese, many from around the world were there. That's where you wear the headsets and you got a translator and for each uh, uh, language and all of that. So I came to know Brother Muammar Gaddafi. I've even met with him, Brother Preston Wilcox and I and some others have met with him. Um, he wants to see, based on the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he wants to see us build an independent nation. He wants us to see us with our own army. You remember once he offered to buy weapons and ammunition. He ought to check him out. All right. I love that spirit. 
Kentucky. Give him a strong black hand. He offered to buy weapons. Of course, Minister Farrakhan said that we have to fight here a certain way, and he didn't want the weapons. So then, brothers and sisters, if you will remember, after the Million Man March, Minister Farrakhan said he got a call. The phone rang, and it was Brother Muammar al-Qaddafi. He wasn't speaking through a translator. He speaks English. He was talking to him in English, and he was so happy. He said, oh, Brother Farrakhan, he said, I saw the Million Man March. He said, it looks like your people are ready now to separate and go for themselves. He said, and I will help you in every way I can. He said, your people can set up there. He said, your people are already trained. Many of Thank you. 